Hi listeners, I wanted to let you know that we are making a few changes to the format of the Gauntlet podcast and that the show will be back for regular episodes in February. In the meantime, we have a couple of special episodes we're going to share with you. The first you're about to listen to is an interview between myself and Lowell about his game Hearts of Wulin, which was originally recorded for Pocket Size Play. Hearts of Wulin is a wuxia metal drama game powered by the apocalypse. It's a really fantastic game, probably some of the most exciting design work in the PBTA space at the moment, and this interview was really solid, really informative. Since it was originally recorded for Pocket Size Play, it contains some references to an actual play series. If you want to listen to that series, just go to the PSP feed. Later this month, we'll have an interview with Karen Twelves. Karen wrote a book called Improv for Gamers, and I sat down to talk with her about it. So for now, enjoy Hearts of Uline, look forward to the interview with Karen, and we'll see you again for regular episodes in February. Thanks. This is Hearts of Wu Lin, Deadly Melody, Episode 00. My name is Jason. I am joined today by Lowell Francis, the designer of the Hearts of Wu Lin game and the GM of the Deadly Melody actual play. Lowell, welcome to Pocket Size Play. Oh, I'm very excited to be here. So listeners, we are getting ready to unleash a brand new actual play in the feed, Hearts of Wu Lin, Deadly Melody. The tricky thing here is Hearts of Wu Lin is a game that's in development. You can't go out and just buy this. And so we thought it would be very helpful to have Lowell on to both discuss what Hearts of Wu Lin even is, uh, give us an overview of the game and that kind of thing, what you can sort of expect, mechanically speaking, as well as to tell us a little bit about this particular actual play series. So, with all that said, Lowell, give us the elevator pitch of Hearts of Wulin. What's it about? So Hearts of Wulin essentially is a wushu melodrama game. It is not like a kung fu movie game, but it's very much a wushu soap opera game. Awesome. And what's the underlying system that it uses? It's built on PBTA, powered by the apocalypse, essentially with some tweaks to that, borrowed from The Veil, from Masks, and some, some other places. Essentially, there's some new things in it, but there's, there's a lot of looking at, at successful tech that I enjoyed. Fantastic. So, you know, I'm not super steeped in wushu melodrama so you might need to unpack that for me a little bit and possibly for listeners who don't know what it is what are the sort of core characteristics of this type of fiction in these wu lin stories these wushu stories and there's some some basic sources that they come from which i'll i'll come back to in in a minute but they are people that are involved in this world that's outside of the the normal world in in a kind of classical timeless china there are all kinds of dynasties and histories and things like that but that's very much a secondary thing instead we have this world of these groups and factions and orders of martial artists that interact with one another they they're outside of the imperial world they're outside of the sort of normal world and they are filled with entanglements uh you know this person loves this person but they're betrayed by this, you know, they're drawn by all of these tensions and anxieties. And then they try to go and talk to people about their feelings, but they can't. <laughs> they talk obliquely about it. If you've seen Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, it's, that's a real movie touchstone where no one can actually express themselves. There's always always a third person in a triangle of, of the relationships between people. And then sometimes they fight. <laughs> and... To, the fights are just another form of sort of solving problems or communicating or heightening the action. Fantastic. So this is interesting. It sounds a little bit like a soap opera or a telenovela, but with fighting. Is that fair? That is exactly what it is. I think I, I've said to Sherry, it's beautiful people doing dumb things who can't communicate. So <laughs> Awesome. I love it. Well, so that's really interesting. Uh, You know, there are other games out there, more traditional games especially, that at the very least have this sort of aesthetic, right? I'm curious in what ways Hearts of Wu Lin differentiates itself from those games, or at least, or I should say perhaps, heightens or exaggerates these particular qualities of the melodrama. Like, what's kind of going on there? 
most of the other games, and really excellent games, there, there's uh, Weapons of the Gods, Ching, uh, Legend, The Legends of the Wu Lin, Tianzia. They're, they're all really solid, interesting games. And they spend a lot of time defining the martial arts and defining the combat styles and a lot of emphasis on that. That's more color in what we're doing. We give the players some tools to define what their style looks like. But then when we get to combat, there are some very basic levels, and it's about who gets to kind of describe what goes on is part of what the, the combat does. So it's it's different from a lot of those games because I'm really focusing on the interpersonal relationships. We're, we're driven by by a set of entanglements. Those drive the story. Those drive the character interactions. And I would say it's half this idea of, okay, we have to go duel, and half this idea of we're characters from a Monster Hearts game. Yeah. You know, that, that kind of tension. Yeah, I've um I've run Hearts of Wulin. I did a series, or play tested, I should say. I did a series called The Red Butterfly. And I found that to be the case. I was surprised by how much it felt like Monster Hearts. And I even wondered if maybe you named it Hearts of Wulin as a sort of like subtle nod to that game. Is that fair? It, it, it is very much, you know, when I first thought about the just uh, doing a game like this a couple of years ago... I wrote out a big, long, chunky, here's all the styles and things like that. And it didn't do the kind of story that I wanted to do. And it wasn't until, honestly, playing Monster Hearts with you that I went, oh, I need to have a way for people to deal with their emotions. And Monster Hearts is, is you know, I wear that heart on, my, on its sleeve, this game does. You know, what's lovely about Monster Hearts is it is a game that, often just kind of runs itself like you just sort of let the players do their thing and then you sort of react as the gm and moves fire off and you know maybe you you know interrupt on a six minus or something but but basically you know it doesn't really need like a rigid structure because the game the moves of the game do so much heavy lifting i found that to be the case in hearts of wulin as well when i ran red butterfly i actually did not I knew almost nothing about Wushu melodrama, right? Apart from just like, mm -hmm. I watched Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon back in the day. And then right around that time, those few years around that time, there were several movies that kind of came out that were kind of like somewhat mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so that was pretty much my only exposure to it. And yet I found that the entanglements, particularly the entanglements, which are basically just sort of... Um, phrases that kind of connect up the characters that that involve their sort of interpersonal drama those entanglements drove the fiction and indeed not just the entanglements but there's like a couple of moves that are attached directly to the entanglements that little tiny handful of like mechanics drove the story in a huge way an impressive way frankly because so even though i didn't really know the touchstone super well uh, some of my players did which helped but also the moves were doing a huge amount of work, and I think that that's, that's pretty great. I'm really happy with how the entanglements work because I've got a list of them, and they're broken into two types. So you've got sort of general entanglements like, oh, my, my master treats me badly, but my friend who studies all under him doesn't object. So we've got three people. What's going on with that? One of them might be a player character. You could put that in. And then the other entanglement is romantic. And so at the start, you're in a, a love triangle right away. And you have to think about that. Right. And you can't stand off from things. You are in a passion, either someone else's or your own. And and people get into that. And and they kind of go away from, oh, I want to do, you know, the lone straggler character. Oh, no, you, you've, got, you've got your world. You've got your passions. You're going to right away play into that and people are ready to go right out the starting blocks then when well, it gives the gm some really easy things to hit too there's a move in the game i can't recall the name of it you're gonna have to re refresh my memory but there's a move in the game that is essentially like act under pressure but it's just for the entanglements it's like whenever you are feeling internally emotionally complicated about something right like you're feeling kind of like torn about something related to the entanglements you have to roll this move and it kind of like has some outcome on the fiction i found that i could just have npcs pull those strings just push on those things and that move would fire off and a huge amount of fiction would flow from it right oh was, yeah was that your intention yeah uh, absolutely inner conflict but besides the dueling mechanics i think inner conflict is the other engine that drives this game and essentially it's a yep. a 
classic PPTA move. When you are confronted by sort of the emotional turmoil from one of your entanglements, roll on a 10 plus, you hold yourself steady. You're able to, to, to maintain yourself in that way. On a seven to nine, you have a choice. You can either mark one of your chi, essentially take some, some harm on yourself and stay steady, or you have to remove yourself from the situation, which is probably embarrassing or uh, upsetting or, or will, will make the problem deeper. And on a six minus, then we get uh, the GM hard moves. Yeah. And it works. It's like really, really good. Like it, and it's, and what I love about it is, and I, and I actually can't say I've even seen anything like this in a PBTA game before. It's essentially like bonds or whatever the sort of social connection currency or stat is in your game, but there's this move attached to it. And it's something that the GM can really like press on. And I found my ability as a GM to interact with that, with the entanglements, like to be quite enjoyable and the players too. The players also did the same thing, right? Oh yeah. So it was pretty tremendous. I want to cut over to the veil inspirations because this game has a very interesting set of stats, which are focused around the sort of classic earth, wind, fire element type things, right? It might be helpful to explain to listeners sort of how that works and uh, and why you took inspiration from The Veil, why you found that to be the best way to do it. So when I first played The Veil, The Veil has a system where you roll based on your emotional state. And there are six states and there's a wheel of emotions. And the more you roll on it, you have a chance of actually spiking that out and having that cause a problem. And when I went into that, I was like, eh, okay, that'll be okay. But it was dynamite at the table. It was a thing that I liked. It felt like it gave us a chance to really, as we're doing something, say, you know, what, what we're feeling, what our what our, our values are, what our, our inner conflicts are. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of Fate Accelerated in these simple approaches. And so when I came to do Hearts of Wulin... I wanted a, a system that was like that. And in the Chinese sort of alchemical system, they have the five qi, air, metal, fire, wood, and water. And they have certain associations with them. And I thought, okay, that's a good, simple system. We make it abstract. It isn't necessarily representative of the full Chinese alchemical values and so on, but it gives us a thing to hang it on. And when you go to roll for almost everything, you say, okay, I think fire is about passion and creativity. I think that's how I'm approaching this action. And so you roll with that stat. And then the, the nice flip side for that is that you've got these five stats, and that's where you take damage. So if you mess up a roll using fire, you're going to mark your fire chi. And that means that that kind of changes you know, what you're feeling, right. yeah. it means that it, it dampens down that fire in you and you don't feel creative or you don't feel passionate, or it can mean that you go overboard, that you're, you're, you're reckless. And it gives players some uh, notes to hang their, their actions on. They don't have to lean into those, but it is a way to kind of really track. And mm -hmm. without doing too much granularity, damage means something in this game. You have to make some, some careful choices but it doesn't require going to another harm track or or those kinds of things. And I wanted to like have that really, 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 really be simple. Right. Yeah. In play, it works really well. I found it to be it's beautifully flexible because the chi can be incorporated into like lots of different types of actions, right? Like it's not just, you know, it's not just I have my social stat and I or I have my physical stat. It's like I have this element and that can influence lots of different things and then when it's marked especially like if it's your combat one it complicates matters significantly right i do want to talk about combat even though we've we've been kind of emphasizing in the discussion the sort of interpersonal conflicts and things like that the combat is actually really quite interesting in this game i would say that it is highly cinematic but highly streamlined and those two things, they feel pretty good in play. So tell us a little bit about combat. And I'm particularly interested in talking about the different challenge levels and the tiers of enemies, because I think that's a really efficient way of kind of handling this sort of fiction. So let's talk about that a bit. So I wanted, when we went to combat, that 
combats are one role resolution. Like we set that up, we go do the role and we see what happens. And in almost all the cases, that's what's going to happen. Um, we're going to, going to have that fight. We're going to roll it and we're going to know what happens. So usually in a scene, I'll pair up all of the conflicts before we echo to any kind of conflict resolution roles, and then we'll run through them, and that will help us play out the, the fiction. Uh, so what we take is the idea of scale, and this is something that I've been thinking about, and then folks at Zhang Hu Hustle, the podcast, use this to break down and analyze some films, and it like crystallized something I've been thinking about. Essentially, when you go to do battle with someone, they are either on your scale, they're below your scale, or they're above your scale. And when you fight someone that is below your scale, you win. The role is to see how awesome you are when you go to do it. If you fail, you have a choice of actually losing, but that's in your hands at that point. I want to lose and get an XP. You know, I'm willing to take that loss. But generally, for, for people below your scale and for groups of adversaries, henchmen, soldiers, things like that, that are collectively below your scale, the same thing happens. When you fight someone that is on your scale, there's a there's a challenge there. And so you can win decisively, in which case you get to kind of say, I'm going to show mercy and maybe mark XP. You get to describe how that looks. If it's a seven to nine, there's going to be a cost to it. Do you take harm or you can choose to deadlock and learn something? Again, you can lose if you want. There's some choices about who has control of, of the narrative and how that looks. Then, of course, if you fight someone above your scale, you lose. You cannot win. Yeah, You cannot win. And the role then is to see how much control you have over describing how you lose. Because, you know, if you don't roll well on that, then I'm going to inflict all kinds of, of uh, uh, horrors and, and, and <laughs> right, innocents yeah. are going to fall and your entanglements are going to get more messy and... It's not just going to be a physical calamity. I'm going to have other things happen. And then associated with that, we've got this idea of scale. And then in play, we look at how you can change that scale. Right. Yeah. I was actually going to say the scale is really interesting because it doesn't just like kind of efficiently arbitrate like winners and losers of combats. It also gives you something to work toward, right? Like I have to beat the red butterfly in my case, in my game's case, who is a very, very like skilled combatant, higher scale than all of us. And so in order to do that, I have to take some kind of fictional action. I have to do something to improve my skills or to improve my chances against her. It just drove play in a great way. And sometimes I'll have higher scale villains that I'll say, well, these two brothers working together, they teamed up. And, and when they're together, they're a higher scale than you. And I'll let players in the scene do actions to change the situation. Yeah, separate them or whatever. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and then that's that's kind of fun, and I'll set those things up. But sometimes they're 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 the big bads, and they've got to go away, and they've got to learn a new technique, they've got to figure out a new approach, and and then they've got to come back to face them. Yeah, that's terrific. I love it when they face a higher scale villain, but they haven't bothered to like study and find out that the person is a higher scale than them. And I'll say, all right, well, when you fight someone who's a higher scale than, than you, and they're like, wait, what? <laughs> right, it's a big and, shock, yeah. <laughs> but they've already already walked into it, so Yeah, I, as a GM, I had fun, like, telegraphing that. Like, I would, I, I was able to telegraph a villain's scale just by the sort of, like, big, flashy entrance mm -hmm. they got into the scene, right? Like, if they were, if they were real chatty and, like, maybe, and if they were kind of chatty and seemed, like, kind of, embittered or like you know or like anxious or ambitious they were probably normal scale right they were probably on your scale but if they were like grand flowing robes severe like intense you know maybe they do something to a minor npc that shows their power the players knew straight away they're a higher scale than me right and and, and it works really nice and again it helps emphasize that melodrama yeah. right like that melodrama comes through so strongly in the combat yeah so that's all really 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 lovely what are the different playbooks that are available? So there are six playbooks that represent broad archetypes, and each one of these has three roles to them, describing variants on them. So the playbooks are the aware. This is a person who knows things, who is based on knowledge. 
and they're about showing how wisdom provides solutions. We've got the Bravo, who is sort of the runaround, drink, enjoy themselves, spoiled character, and they're about enjoying every moment. We have the Loyal, and this is your classic hero who follows something, is dedicated to something. Maybe they're a, a magistrate or eldest son, and they are about the tension between duty and self. Then there's the outsider, who is the person who acts against convention. They can be wanderers or tricksters. The student, who is the young character trying to learn, trying to figure things out, trying to gain wisdom, and they're about being naive. And then the last one we have is a later edition called The Unorthodox, which is a character who doesn't know their own power, or they're hiding their power, or they don't look like they know martial arts. It's if you want to have a little more unusual set of things. Those are tropes that go off a little bit, potentially comedic, potentially odd tropes, but a lot of people like that stuff. So I, I had that in there. It was one that Sherry suggested. So I want to take a moment to pose a couple of questions that were uh, given to us by Twitter users. Uh, I asked people on Twitter if they had any questions they wanted me to ask you. And we had a couple of pretty good ones. The first is about how many sessions do you th imagine Hearts of Wulin taking to play? So I have been able to do really satisfying one shots with it. What you're about to listen to is effectively a one shot because it's two sessions of two and a half hours. And I've run it at Origins and for Gauntlet Con as one hour of character creation, three hours of play, and we get a satisfying story. But I've also been able to play it now for six, seven sessions. We're doing a, a longer book. I think that probably we're looking at that sort of classic PBTA anywhere from, from six to 10. You could probably tell a good story. You could stop at any point. One of the things that I emphasize in sort of longer term play is at the start of sessions, we look at your entanglements do you want to rewrite them? Have they changed? Have things occurred with that? And so you're not stuck with those. And your character and their feeling and their emotion, their connections can evolve during play. And I think that that kind of helps. When I ran Red Butterfly, we did four sessions. Most of the first session was taken up by character creation. And, and it was a pretty short session. I just had kind of like a little kind of opening scene. And then we stopped. I think we could have gone to like eight pretty easy, eight or more. So... We're, we're in the second book of a three-book trilogy, a second month of play, and it felt very coherent. We had some players change out, but it, it felt felt good. Uh, Darren got his arm cut off. <laughs> um, he's a one-armed swordsman mm -hmm. with the, the fan. And, and so it is the same stuff. I don't feel like I'm hitting that point where, okay, the characters have kind of hit their There's end There's not much else yet. to do with it, yeah. 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 That's good. That's good to hear. Uh, another Twitter question is... Let's talk about like the sort of dial between magic and realism and, and all that. Like, how do you envision like magic in the setting and how can you kind of change that for your taste level? So one of the things that as a default, I'm very much looking at people can do wondrous things, but those are kind of expected. That's the martial arts. That's that's the ability to to light foot up a wall or run across the top of a building, you know, all of those things that are, we classically see that are strange and unusual, but it's, it's expected in the genre. Now past that is the question of like ghosts and spirits and, and, and even wizards in this. By default, I don't have those as an element. People believe in them. People are superstitious about them and worried about them, but they're not a thing. But I have been working on some very basic tools. If you want to add in kinds of characters that interact with those, essentially their new roles under the playbooks, and then some other new options for that. I'm, I'm going to provide some tools, but it's going to be purely the group's option about how much they want to have magic as a thing. Yeah, we actually, in my <laughs> in the Red Butterfly, the players knew me well enough to know that I like to add horror into games because that's my thing. I love to have mm -hmm. horror elements. And so they were straight away, when we were doing our sort of tone and subject matter discussion, they were saying, you know, if you want to do ghosts, I'm cool with that, right? And so we actually had some, like, strong kind of, like, ghosty horror vibes at certain points. And it worked great. It was perfectly fine. Yeah, and that's in genre for a whole wonderful set of films that deal with that can also have the melodrama with them. So I think that's a great inspiration. 
Mm, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, so before we leave this part of the discussion, um, I want to just say in the interest of full disclosure that uh, Hearts of Wulin is going to be part of the Gauntlets imprint. Um, it is the first full game uh, outside of Codex that we will be publishing. And so listeners, I think most people are aware of that already, but just in case you weren't, I also want to say something that was kind of beyond the scope of this conversation, but I think is important to say is that we will be hiring a sensitivity reader, uh, Agatha Chang from the Asians Represent podcast. Uh, she is a big fan of both Hearts of Wulin and the genre. And uh, so we're going to be hiring her to help out with some of the sort of like cultural aspects of the setting. And so I think that's going to really, really make it a pretty fantastic text when it's all said and done. Is there anything else you want to say about it before we move on to the AP part? The one thing I do want to say is I've had a, a number of people ask me about what are good sources for getting into this kind of genre, especially if they're not familiar. I would say, again, on movies, Hero, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, older Shaw Brothers movie called Sentimental Swordsman. Those are all good. If you like fantasy, then Bride with White Hair and Chinese Ghost Story and Painted Skin. Those are all good. If you want a book, Legends of the Wu Lin is a great RPG with a lot of reference material, but a crazy complicated system. But there's so much good stuff in it. There are some translations of these novels that a lot of these movies are based on. Recently, Legends of the Condor Heroes came out. But the thing that I'm drawing from are Chinese multi-episode wushu soap operas, a lot of them based on novels. Some of them you can find on streaming services. Some of you can, you can find on YouTube. Look for Laughing in the Wind, Smiling Proud Wanderer, Flying Fox of Snowy Mountain, or The Handsome Siblings slash Proud Twins. There are various names for them. You can find them and watch a few episodes of those and you'll go, oh, okay, this is really complicated. They're crazy characters doing all kinds of goofy things. And I think you might fall in love with them like I did. Fantastic. Well, there's some companion adventures for you there, listeners. So that's good. Let's talk about Deadly Melody, this actual play that we are coming up on here. So tell us, first of all, Lowell, who are the players and who are the characters that they're playing in Deadly Melody? First, we have Agatha. This is the first time I had a chance to play with her. And this is only the second time that I ran Hearts of Wulin. So I'm really happy about how well it went this session. She played a an official Magistrate Lin, who is engaged to one of the other characters, and there's some complications from that. And the person that she's engaged to is Fraser's character, Wailing Pain Lei, who is an outsider wanderer. She's a musician, but she's also a secret assassin, and that becomes complicated. And then their mutual friend, uh, played by Matt Weatherby, is Ming. He is a student and a wandering monk, and he's a terrible monk, <laughs> as you will hear throughout this. There is a, a wonderful moment between him and Magistrate Lin that kind of makes me gasp each time. And then uh, Michael Barford played the character Lucky Dog, who's a loyal swordsman. Unfortunately, Michael wasn't able to be there for the full session. So you'll see Lucky Dog drops out after episode one. Ah, okay. Good to know. Let's talk about some highlights. Uh, what, what would you, you, you already kind of highlighted one, but um, what are, what's, a, what's a real big standout moment from this AP that people should look out for? So there is a moment when Magistrate Lin confronts Ming about his choices and kind of turns him around. And it is, it is really good. Like it works. Um, so I love that moment. I love the, the goofiness of the very first tavern combat and how complicated that gets and how the different things line up. There's a moment before that where, where Fraser's character kind of messes up a role and accidentally, you know, reveals something in front of her fiance that ends up blowing up. There's another moment where Fraser leans into the study move, essentially the information move, which we also allow people to, besides ask questions, like declare a major game-changing fact. And Frazier went, oh, I guess my sister's a secretly trained assassin. And that changed everything. And it was brilliant. I forgot about that in the other part of the discussion. I love that move. That move is, that aspect of the game is so cool. How you can like 
define some lore. It's really great. Yeah. And players can do it, but if they don't want to, they can they can hand it off to me. And I, I want to give them the option without too much pressure. And people have used it in really smart ways in play. Well, and it's kind of couched in there in a way to where it doesn't disrupt the main story mm-hmm. either, like the way you have it set up. I didn't find it to be disruptive, which I think is really, really terrific. The, the one last highlight I will also mention is if you listen closely, you can see how I forget the name of the NPC Auntie Ping <laughs> and to call her Auntie Silver uh, between episodes. So those two characters are, in fact, the same character because I was enjoying myself so much. Usually I'm pretty good about writing down names and stuff, but I lost it because I was just watching everybody play. It's it's an imperfect medium and it happens. It's a thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm super excited. Um, I've listened to Deadly Melody. It's really, really fun. And I've played Hearts of Ulin. It's also very, very fun. And I think listeners are going to really, really enjoy this. Uh, Lowell, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. And listeners, enjoy Hearts of Ulin, Deadly Melody. Hi listeners, I want to tell you about the newest issue of Codex, Codex Emerald. At 60 pages, Codex Emerald is the biggest issue of Codex yet. It also happens to be the best. Here's what you'll find inside. Emerald City Drama Club, a surreal and dreamy framework for Monster Hearts 2, about a group of kids putting on a production of The Wizard of Oz. Dark Designs and Verdigree, a game about exploring the Emerald City's seedy underbelly, a neighborhood called Verdigree, with mechanics inspired by World of Dungeons and traditional fantasy games. Dulhoven, a deluxe scenario for Dungeon World that explores a labyrinth of dwarven tunnels, stairs, homes, workshops, and crypts. It features a lot of really fantastic forward-looking tech for Dungeon World. Our miscellany, Three Dozen Jeweled Treasures, Allegedly Blessed or Cursed, Nine Original Illustrations, and Custom Layouts by Jake Householder and Jesse Ross. To get Codex Emerald, just make a $5 or higher pledge on the Gauntlet Patreon by February 1st. That's at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. Thanks. Thanks.